Welcome to Cinema 100. This is a show where we embark on a captivating cinematic journey through time, exploring the finest films from 1927 to the present day. We do this in chronological order, mind you. Now join Will and I as we delve into the heart of each movie, dissecting its narrative intricacies and drawing connections to the socio-political landscapes of its era. From the silent era's birth to the digital age's innovation, we not only showcase cinematic masterpieces, but also unravel the historical tapestry that weaves them into the fabric of our shared human experience. Now, additionally, anticipate the excitement of our annual draft episodes. This is where we carefully curate a list of contenders for the upcoming year's exploration. Our meticulous selection process ensures a diverse and engaging lineup, providing a snapshot of the cinematic landscape during each period. To put this simply, Will and I select movies based upon a half day's research that we could find the time to come up with. We are adults, however, with full-time jobs. But more importantly, every decade concludes with a thought provoking recap episode where we reflect on the standout films, compare their impact and collaboratively rank our favorites offering listeners, you a unique perspective on the evolution of filmmaking over the years. Again, to put this simply what movies sucked and which ones didn't. So grab your popcorn, grab a seat and join us on this riveting odyssey through the annals of cinema history. This is cinema 100. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. My name is Robert Gifford, and this is Cinema 100. That's right. We are discovering 100 years of cinema from 1927 to, well, present day 1923 or 2023. Uh, myself, Robert Gifford, and my best friend, who you can see on the screen here with me, William Delzeeth. Will, how we doing, buddy? Good. How you doing, Rob? Doing good, man. So here's the thing. The year is 1927, and finally in the history of cinema cinema gets a voice and that's what we're going to talk about the reason we chose 1927 as our let's say j launching point is because it was the year the first talkie came out and before we dive into the jazz singer and all the wonderful things that we know about it or don't know about it prior we're going to talk about kind of what this show is and why we're doing it um I made a phone call to will sometime back and said hey will listen i've been wanting to do this thing for a while um the idea being go back in time and watch all the important films in the history of cinema american films international films just all the milestones that kind of make this thing up and why we love this medium so much um you want to venture a podcast with me and you know take this road and and i promise you i promise you we'll actually finish it <laughs> <laughs> and Will gave his comments. So to that, Will, when I first gave you the phone call, what, did you, what were your thoughts? Well, my first thought was, how do you always catch me in a Wendy's parking lot? Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I swear, every time, every time you call, I'm sitting in a fast food joint, probably giving away too much about my diet. But uh, no, I think I'm, I've, I've always loved movies. I've always loved film. I've always loved stories. And I don't know enough about the history of film. And I thought this was a project that just sounded like a ton of fun and um you know with your guidance and our uh, collective abilities hopefully we can make our way through some movies here and learn a little bit on, along the way yeah i think you just hit it right there learn is the big thing um i i a few years back during co covid during quarantine a buddy of mine did this thing uh quarantine catch up and he got on facebook hashtag quarantine catch up and it was just this opportunity for him to sit down and another lover of film, but sit down and watch some of the classics that kind of fell through the gaps along the way, whether, whether it be, you know, your own personal biases against something or a stigma against something, or you just missed it. And we all have those classics that we still haven't seen that we'd probably be ashamed to say out loud as movie lovers. But I know personally, when I think about that, I thought that was a great idea, but I was like, man, I kind of want to go one step further. I want to do it in chronological order. I want to do it from the beginning. And the reason we said 1927 is because that's the first talkie, but I believe it's probably going to take some time to get us to present day 2027. I think if we can get this show or this done in four years, Will, that's our that's our goal. Well, we're going to try to get... Movie, we can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is that this is going to be a draft style process. So I'll explain it to the viewers so that you guys can come along for the ride with us. So... Will and I are going to have our slate of films every year, and we're going to present them to the table. One of the episodes will be a draft. 
Uh, we'll talk about the films and why we, you know, through our research, what we believe to be um, the the big movies, the big moments of that year. And we are going to be tackling all genres um, across the board um, because they all have their, you know, their kind of tent poles throughout history, especially in the history of cinema. And early on, things like horror and sci-fi really, really grabbed our attention, you know, long before we got to some of the, you know, genres that we love now. Um, I think, and this is just my opinion, but I think, you know, if we present three or four films each and we kind of draft the ones and kind of come to a consensus, we can move through these years relatively quickly. If we have five movies for that year that we think are, um, you know, the relevant ones that we need to talk about, we'll have five episodes recapping all of those movies so that you guys can dive in and engage with us. Um, and then that way we can kind of pick along the way what the best movies are. But at the end of that year, when we're done wrapping up all of those movies, we Pick which one we thought kind of, you know, stood out amongst all the best ones and uh, which one stands to the top. And we'll continue to do this. And then we'll do another draft of the next year. And we'll continue to do maybe a decade of what decade is the best or what year slate of movies is the best in the end. But that's way down the road. Will had a great idea. In addition to just doing movies, let's tie it into American society. Let's tie it into where Americans were at that time. Where was the global or where was the world at during that time? So in 1927, which is our launching point, you know, Will had this great idea to have a bigger picture perspective of why these movies were being made in the first place. Why did you think that was important to tie into this, Will? Well, I mean, I, I think if you take a look at the last, I mean, as long as we've been alive and you kind of pay attention to the movies along the way, <clears throat> a lot of the ones that stand out are the ones that can say something about, you know, the American psyche or the individual psyche in America at that time. And, uh, you know, thinking back to like the late sixties, early seventies, when, you know, John Wayne was ruling the, the, the cinema and everyone was watching John Wayne movies and how, you know, that individualism was still kind of at the forefront. And now, you know, you kind of see that recession into like, what have we overplayed the individual and yeah. um, how we kind of, you know, there's ebb and flow as uh, you know, the years went on with Hollywood. And I'm just curious to see as we go along and we're choosing these movies, how, how we can tie it back to what the world was like then. And um, you know, maybe give us an idea of why they were making those type of movies in the first place. So. Yeah. I think about when you say that individualism, I think about uh, John Wayne's the green beret where he takes on as a, as a Marine takes on this entire, I, I, I don't know if it's Russia or who it is, but he just takes them on by himself. And then in the seventies, you see this switch to like, you know, like apocalypse now and more of the mental, you know, uh, you know, PTSD kind of more of that part of war and less about how we can do it all as, you know, one person. And then you get to the eighties and we're back to Rambo and back to, you know, uh, die hard. Yeah, all these things, you know, back to the individualism. So, it, like you said, it's an ebb and a flow type of thing. Uh, I, I, I think what I love about what we're trying to tackle here is that we'll be able to hold each other accountable. The audience will be able to hold us accountable. We'll hold them accountable as well. Um, but like, I'm in no hurry, man. Like, I, you know, like, I don't want to. I'm in no hurry to get to the '80s. I want to dive in and really enjoy, you know, the the jazz singer. You know, I want to enjoy what the 1939, which I've told you is I've been reading is touted to be one of the best years on record. You know, I want to see what those movies are like. I know The Wizard of Oz is on there, but what else, you know, is in that slate of films and, and why do people continue to hold it to this day? You know, damn near 100 years later. Um, so that's kind of like the format of what we're going for. Let's talk a little bit about film leading up to 1927, Will. Now, do you know the story or like the history of how cinematography kind of came about? Like, do you know the Edward um, Moybridge story about the horses uh, and the bet uh, and how we, he accidentally came into moving pictures? Only uh, anecdotally, 
anecdotally, like, um, you know, through like watching film or TV shows, like where it's mentioned, like, um, Nope, right? This is brought up in Nope. It is, uh, yes. Or in a few, a couple years ago. So, you know, just as far as I've experienced it in film itself, but no, I don't know. Lay it out for me. I, I don't know it. I, I don't know it word for word. Okay. Basically, there's yeah. a couple rich guys at a track, horse track. And yeah. uh, one rich guy says, I guarantee you that all four legs of a horse come up at the same time. They're off the ground at the same time. The other rich guy says, you're crazy. There's got to be at least one foot down at, at any given time. They hired Edward Moybridge to come in and to figure out how to um, provide proof because he was a uh, he was kind of specializing and experimenting in photographs at the time, and he put up white sheets and painted the white background behind the one dark horse, and he did it the entire length of this track and basically set up a bunch of different cameras. And as the horse was running, he captured all these cameras or it captured all these photographs, and sure enough, they seen it. His the the legs of the horse they were off the ground at the same time, but they accidentally came into when they put them in sequence, you could see right. the horse moving. And hmm. that's when this was shared with the world. And then after that, you know, you get into like, you know, even 19 years later from what I understand is when Thomas Edison and the Lumiere brothers out of France and those guys started jumping on. And that's when you hear things like the Edison shorts. They started, you know, kind of, um, playing with film a little bit, playing with these these short little movies. And I don't know if you guys know the term, but Nickelodeons came about. So like Nickelodeon, the channel that we all love and behold in the 90s, you know, basically were these little movie boxes that people would go up to and watch these short little films that would be put together, you know, for entertainment on the city, on the city streets. What I love about the Nickelodeons is the story is old as time. Now we talk about society, right? Going all the way back to the early 1900s, late 1800s, you have no rich person would be caught dead, apparently, watching a Nickelodeon. Mm. Apparently, yeah. it was beneath them. So that kind of gives you an idea of where the, the, the craft and where the skill set of movie making was in early day cinema and just like the eyes of the, you know, the, the elite at the time it was looked down upon why do you think that is oh yeah i mean it probably a lot of times when things are new and things are adored by the masses i would imagine that they um would be ignored by um the elite class right um so i i would imagine that has something to do with it for sure yeah and i think you're right i look at the part maybe it's cheap entertainment too so you know it's made for the common man or maybe just made for anybody oh, sure. but um, yeah, and I mean, yeah, go ahead. theater, uh, I was just going to say theater, I mean, in the 1880s, 1890s, I know German idealism was really popping off, right? Um, like <laughs> Wagner and... Um, a, a term you know, phrased or coined by the Germans, yes, popping exactly. off? <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually the Russians, right? Um, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, touche. Yeah, no, so theater was, you know, elitist, um, I mean... The, you would get dressed up, you'd go to the theater, you'd have a night, you'd have the, the, the owner's boxes. And, um, you know, if you got lucky, you could sit in the very back, maybe, um, kind of, kind of this way today. Um, but I would imagine that, you know, you have an elite class that kind of puts the theater up on the pedestal and you got, you know, something super cheap that can be seen by just about anybody on the, on the street, then it would probably be looked down upon. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I forgot about the theater aspect of it. Um, especially during those times, you know, that was, uh, you know, actually not just those times that that's a craft that went back a long ways going back to, you know, Kings and jesters and the whole thing. Right. Um, sure. that's, that, that was, you're right. What a good point that was. Um, I wonder if during that time, if you, I just wonder if the movie making process too, like it had to be very difficult because these were big bulky machines at the time. It was a slow process. You know, nobody was thinking feature films. You know what I mean? I just wonder if it was, uh, you know, if that has something to do with it too. It, it, there's more of a, like, it's almost like there's a dance to theater, right? And there's an yeah. elegance, there's a class, you know, where laboring over this big bulky, you know, process yeah. and just experimenting that's kind of beneath the, the, the elitist. 
Yeah, no, for sure. And then I'm sure there's also, there's always the factor of when something's brand new, when it's, when someone's innovating and there's a group of people making changes, it's hard to make changes when you're rich because you, you, you're rich, right? You're you've, rich. You've got what's work. You've got what's working for you and whatever's been working, why would you want to change it? So, I mean, until, until you get to those, those twenties, when studios have started to take over the game and they realize that money is, uh, you can make money off of these things. That's, that's when you would probably see that, that flip from, you sure. know, the theater to the, the, the movie theater. Well, it's funny because by the end of the 1920s, it's reported that something like 90 million people are attending movies. All right. Hmm. And that tells you the switch that came in. It's not just because of the talkies, but it's because of the introduction of sound that came in. You know, you, 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 mm-hmm. you start, you know, you get these, these uh, orchestras that play along, you know, that kind of help with the narrative of storytelling a little bit. You know, I don't, you get these feature long films with these orchestras and now you're sitting there and you, you get probed by the emotion of the song. You know, it's, it's, it's ways to tap into our feelings without necessarily hearing people speak. But in 1927, the first ever words that are spoken are sung going back to music, just playing on the emotions of the human. And that was a part talkie and we'll, we'll get into that with the jazz singer. But like up to that point, it was all silent films and then when sound came, that was kind of the, the big next step in this process of getting us to where we are now with the amazing, incredible technological advancements. Um, hell, I'd, yep. you can be dead with AI now and you can, you can live again. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're a long way from 2027 when we talk about that, but it's crazy. I'm not going to talk about AI, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's if we live to Don't see 2027, that. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's just kind of where the state of film was at the time, you know, in the, in the 1920s, it's interesting because in American society, you know, you, you start having this kind of cultural shift, you know, of young people kind of getting more involved in, in being more rebellious. You've got the nightlife, you got the introduction of jazz music coming up to the North, you know, from the South, Mm -hmm. you've got all these things that are taking place. Um, it's funny because I always... I always, as a kid, I remember when we would learn about the Roaring Twenties. As a teenager, I was like, "Man, what a time it would have been to be alive during that time period." And I think about it because <laughs> I can remember that thought. And I'm like, "Here's Robert Gifford. I've never smoked, drank, or done a drug a day in my life, and I'm thinking the Roaring Twenties were the, was the decade for me." I don't know if that makes sense, but it seems like a lot of fun. <laughs> you fit right in. You're not allowed to drink anyway, so. Yeah, good call. Yeah, prohibition during that time. You're right. So anyways, that's kind of like, that's the state of film where we were at at the time. Um, the country is just coming off of World War I. We're now in, uh, to the point where there's prohibition, right? You have the early days of the, you know, the great, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not the recession, but the... Um, yeah, depression, yeah. The, yeah, the Great Depression during that time is getting ready to come up. So this is mm-hmm. like an interesting time in, it's almost like the calm before the storm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't know what your thoughts are on where Americans were and where society was as a whole in the 20s as we kind of get up to, you know, the jazz singer in 1927 and what's, you know, specifically on slate for that year. But like, just as a whole, what do you, when you look at kind of a snapshot of a what do you what do you think was happening with people in in just this country like the back and forth yeah yeah i mean the tensions uh, very similar to the last decade and a half right i mean i mean it's been a minute since i've done a political like deep research um but you know before before like 2008 when the the recession happened um it had been since the 20s that we'd seen such large uh, discrepancy between like, you know, wage earners, like the bottom 20% versus the top 1%. So, you know, that same type of tension between like the, the lower classes, the, there wasn't a middle class yet, but the lower classes and the, the people who were running corporations, running companies that, that right before you, you see the stock markets crash. And like, I think it's the 1927, 1928 area, you, 
what you, what you get is just this rising uh, earner the, of the top percent. So, you know, that, that, that tension between the masses and the, the elites was really rising in those, those years. So um, I think you made a really good point about jazz kind of uh, up and coming during the twenties there. Um, you just, I think you had a, a large amount of people who were trying to find ways to express themselves and um, find themselves and be able to, you know, live their American dream and weren't able to find it. So they, that's why we start seeing all these stories about, we start getting obsessed with watching f- movies, watching stories that see an individual ex- achieve their dreams, achieve their desires. So, and jazz is a very exuberant kind of kind of music that allows you to feel the people around you and, you know, joy. So. Yeah. I, uh, when you talk about tensions, um, I was, it's so funny when you, it's not funny at all, actually, but yeah, it makes you wonder if like, um, is there ever really, I know everything's amplified now. And then, you know, without getting into the, the, the global stage of where we're at right now, cause it, that's about as scary as it's been in our lifetime, as far yeah. as besides like, you know, on a global stage, right. There was the domestic yeah. issue in 2001 and that was ongoing and we were afraid for, you know, the terrorists yeah. and stuff of that nature, but like on a global scale right now. Um, I just wonder, like, have we grown? You know, is it, mm. you know, and it felt like for a while, I used to say, it's so funny because like I can, I can, I almost have to push back against my, my ever growing pessimism that's creeping into my optimistic nature where I've been optimistic my entire life, but it seems things are just kind of, Things are off kilter right now in my head, where I, the way I view the world, and it, and it makes me feel like a man with no country at times. Because like for a while, I used to say progress is inevitable. I, yeah. I, I that's how I believed for forever. I believe you know what you can have resistance and it might stick for a year or two, but progress is inevitable. And I, that might have been a little naive to say. Because especially in the last, you know, five, six, seven years, it really feels like, you know, progress can be, uh, first of all, progress is is subjective, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not, progress to me is not necessarily progress to someone else. I've learned that. Um, Yeah. But it just makes me wonder over a span of a hundred years here, when we just look at it, you know, in in this, you know, these loaves of bread here is... Are we any different now than we were then? Are we still that same American society still chasing our own individual pursuit of happiness and it clashes with everybody else's individual pursuit of happiness? And can we ever really achieve it? And is this still the best example of this in, in the history of, uh, you know, freedom and democracy? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a big question. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know if we've, how far we've come. I mean, I obviously think that there's been progress in the last hundred years. Um, I think that's pretty clear. I'm, I'm a, a white dude. And if you weren't a white dude a hundred years ago, um, you had a lot less uh, uh, opportunities, right? So I definitely think that there's progress has been made. Um, I think part of that pessimism is, um, you know, I've always been on the opposite side, right? Like my nature is pessimism. Um, and you know, (laughs) things like, things like movies and good albums, they give me, they give me some optimism. So that's why I've always kind of been drawn, drawn to film, but I I just think you're getting older, man. And you're, you're a good human. You're, you're, you pay attention to stuff. And, um, when you pay attention to stuff, it's hard to not let the negative stuff creep in because I mean, it's the, the bad hand fallacy in, in poker, right? Like you, you don't remember your good hands. You just right. remember the bad ones. It's the right. same with same with life. So um, that's you know, yeah, because that fallacy works the- both ways. When you're winning at the casino, you feel like it's right. going to continue to be that way forever. You know exactly. So. Yeah, and then yeah, and you know it it doesn't help that. I mean, if if what you fall back on for um, connecting with the world 
like for me, I don't, I don't get out a lot. I got, I, I've got two kids for people who don't know <laughs> me or maybe know me and haven't seen me in 10 years. Um, but uh, I've got two kids. I, I work a full-time job. I've got two dogs. I, I don't go a ton of places. So when I want to connect, what I do is I tap into a movie or I tap into a TV show or um, I try to engage with a story because I, you know, I feel very strongly that's how we connect with each other is by listening to each other's stories. But over the last decade, over the last maybe even 15, 20 years, what we've seen is kind of a shift in the, the happy ending, right? We don't get a ton of happy endings anymore. So we can watch a great film. Um, like No Country for Old Men in 2007, right? Right. One of my favorite yep. movies of all time. That's not a happy ending. <laughs> um, and uh, as we get more and more of that, like it, it can, can it can start to kind of bleed into um, who wh- what you identify with and who you are as a person. Um, so, you know, that, that probably doesn't help much either. No, it doesn't. Uh, and it's funny, without getting too much into that, because I, uh, I think that's a discussion that would be good to have just in general, just the, the idea of uh, ending something with not a happy ending. Um, mm. And as a viewer, what it does to the viewer experience and how they're supposed to process it. Because we've had so many of these great stories being told over the last 10, 15 years, Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, these stories that we love, these big epic adventures or these big epic stories that are deeply rooted in in human, you know, um, pain and suffering and um, whatever, all the things that all the, you know, the, the, the themes that go with it. I always am left going, what the hell am I supposed to do with this now? Like right. it bothers me actually so much so that I can't remember what was the last movie I watched where I remember thinking to myself like, okay, now what, what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. Um, but it's just, and that's a conversation for another day. But like the, the point is, is that, that's the shift. That's what's happening now with storytelling. Let's go back to the early 19s, 1900s, and we start getting to these places where we start getting orchestras and sound is being brought into it. And believe it or not, there was an epic called The Birth of a Nation. Have you heard of this movie? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was three and a half hours long with an intermission. That's unheard of back in the day you think that's something that is new or you know not new but relatively new to the 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 modern cinema um that's something that happened in early 1900s now here's my question because you talk about tensions and not just tensions with you know classes but tensions with race that you you know in in a free american society you're always probably going to have unfortunately on some level um but during that time the birth of a nation basically was a story and I, and I am very much going, I'm not going over the plot, but I'm just talking, paraphrasing here, the idea of shining a light on the KKK in a positive fashion. Right. Mm -hmm. And at the time birth of the nation was the highest grossing movie of its time at that time, up until that point, um, did very well at the box office. None of these is a shocker to anybody. Here's where the question comes in. And this is what, on some of the podcasts that I've been listening to, and I'd love to get your take on this before I give you mine. This kind of goes back to a few years ago when statues and, you know, people were talking about how we needed to whitewash everything. Where's yeah. Birth of a Nation fit into the discussion of whether or not it should be discussed or shouldn't be discussed? Should we just put it behind the back burner and not acknowledge it at all? Or should it be discussed? I'm, I'll give you the floor and then I'll give you my thoughts after. Yeah, for for me, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if you can't if you can't separate out the timeline, the time that it was made in and conceived in, um, from you, what you think now, then you're making a mistake because right. um, you you have. If we're going to take ourselves seriously when we're having a conversation about. Uh, an art form or a medium, then you have to engage with the things that are there for you to engage with. You can't just exclude things um, because you don't agree with them. Um, I mean, you can, uh, and I, you know, I have this, just as an example, I have this problem with anime, right? Like anime is a very popular genre, but I just, I I have this big X over it because I just don't, (laughs) 
it's just not for me, right? I am sure there's probably a dozen anime that I could watch and just be like, oh yeah, like this is actually really good. But it just, you know, it's not for me. So I don't, I don't engage with it. But, you know, kind of to bring it back to the birth of the nation, like if, if you can't, if you can't engage with it because it brings up some sort of like trauma or something, then that's, I understand. But if you're going to try to, in, if you're going to try to understand it in the context of the time, if you're going to understand it in the context of film, then I, I feel like cutting it off doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I totally agree. That's, that's totally where I'm at. Because I, first of all, it goes back to this notion of like, um, it, you know, if you don't know your history, you're going to repeat your same mistakes type thing, right? And to me, it's important to know that that film existed. It's important to know that not only did it exist, it was celebrated at the time, you know, and mm. as a person of empathy, it, it makes you wonder how that's even possible. But you, you, even that thought isn't fair for me to have because you kind of have to remove yourself and put yourself into those times. Now, I always wonder, you know, you, you've heard a term of like, oh, well, our grandparents were just born in a different time. So when people say that, usually they're excusing some type of behavior, right? Sure. And I don't even know if that's fair. You know, we've had, yeah. I've had discussions, many discussions with people about whether or not people should be allowed to plateau in their human growth because they hit a certain age or whether or not yeah. they should, right? Yeah. Or if yeah. they should always be seeking a, a, a greater truth and a greater, you know, just self-development should always be mm -hmm. an ongoing thing, even when you hit your late glory years, 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, one thing I remember yeah. about my grandfather is... uh my grandfather never said a racist thing ever, right? In the sense of like I, that I knew growing up. You know what I mean? Yeah, like explicitly racist. Yeah, explicitly racist. Right? Yeah, you know what I mean? Explicitly racist. But I remember, and we have a, you know, Tynan. Tynan was uh, probably the first black friend in our friend group um, growing up, and sure. just the idea of that generation. I remember wanting Tynan to spend the night. And I remember like being terrified to ask my grandfather if he could spend the night after a football game on the weekend. And that was not even like something he ever installed in or instilled in me, but like it was just something that was there because of the, the generation of all the things that we've learned. And I remember asking him in like just the moment of relief when he's like, yeah, sure. Your friend Tiny can spend the night. And, I, to this day, I feel so much shame when I remember saying, okay, grandpa, but he's black. And my grandpa being like, Robert, like basically saying, why did you even mention that? Like, that was unnecessary. You know what I mean? I felt that was me not, that was me not being explicitly racist, but implicitly, you know what I mean? That was me yeah. on some level yeah. being racist. You know what I mean? Because I brought that into play, even though it was by no means malicious because I loved the guy i just wanted to make sure that you know he was grandpa was comfortable i wanted tiny to be comfortable in that environment i wanted everybody on the same page um but yeah i just that's crazy how these these factors live in us and at that time you go back to birth of a nation i can't even imagine um you know if you're a uh a, a black man come up from the south you're living in new york you are a jazz band member and you still can't walk through the front door. You have to go through the back door. You're still looked down upon. And then you look out in the crowd as you're playing your music and all these people are dancing to your entertainment, to your skill level, but yet somehow still being lesser than it's just, it's a, it's this weird dichotomy that at play. So, yeah, I mean, I can understand if you have some sort of trauma, but as a movie goer, a serious movie goer, I do think those things have to be dissected, talked about. And, and just because someone acknowledges that there's good camera technique in a film like that, that doesn't mean that they're condoning that the film itself is, is something that should be celebrated. So, right. Yeah. But. And if birth of the nation was made right now, like I'm not watching that shit, right? but right. It, that's, that's being able to contextualize. So that's, you wouldn't that's watch it. Is that what you said? You would not watch it. If it was made, like if it was made today. Oh, oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. But because it was made a hundred years ago, and there's it's part of the foundation, 
like you need to you can't you can't have the rest of the building without the foundations so if you you have to be able to understand the foundations in order to you know progress through the rest of the building so yeah totally agree man totally agree um so jumping forward now we're going to do, usually this is the part of the show where we would do some type of draft, right? So we would have our movies, we would present them to each other. Uh, you know, if it was 1928, we're going to have a slate of talkies, a slate of movies um, that we can, uh, you know, handpick and go down that road. Um, but it's 1927. We have the jazz singer, the only talkie of that year. It <clears throat> innovated the game so much so that it's, it's, where we are today. I mean, I don't know what the sure. next, you know, there's been so many other innovations that come after it, but like, this is like the big one, right? We now yeah. have voice. We now have everything that we need. We have the video, we have the color. Well, we don't have the color yet. We don't quite mm -hmm. have the color yet. So we have the video, black and white film. We have the sound, we have the voice. We don't quite have the color that will come later. Um, are you excited about watching a black and white film? Where are you at with black and white films? Do they bother you? No. Not at all. No, I, I like black and white films. I mean, I'm, I'm anticipating some pacing issues, right? Uh, movies yep. just move at a different pace now than they used to. Um, and that probably says more about, you know, our, our attention spans um, than <laughs> anything else. But um, I, you know, I'm, I'm mostly excited to just um, have know what to watch next, right? I think that's part of my excitement for the project because we're going to pick some stuff to watch and we're going to watch it. You know, yes. that's, you know, that's the other modern issue um, that we have is there's just so many things we're inundated and uh, spend that first half hour looking for something. And then you end up watching uh, Full House or something like that on Nickelodeon. Dude, that's so true. <laughs> that shows how much you actually do that because Full House isn't that's on Nickelodeon. I know you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I uh, do. That's so true. I was just telling you, I think a couple weeks back. I watch less movies now than I did as a kid, not because of a time issue, because I still have similar night habits. You know, I, I, for the audience, I still don't have kids. I'm 36 going on 37. I don't have a family of my own yet. Um, so time is still available to me. Um, and as a entrepreneur, of, you know, as a small business owner, I kind of get to set my own schedule. So if, you know, if I want to stay up a little longer and watch a movie, I can do that and start my day a little later. I got that. I've got that, um, that privilege. However, I remember the days of HBO. I remember the days of, you know, of like cable, basically turning it on and seeing a, a slate of movies, you know, two of which are, I've seen the next five. I haven't, and just flipping through the channels and coming upon a scene and just mm -hmm. being, okay, what's going on here? Like, it's not until you see a scene of something and you see a performance by an actor or, you know what I mean? Some type of compelling, some, you know, narrative that's taking place and you're watching it and you're like, Oh, I need to watch the next 45 minutes of this. And then you're flipping forward to when it comes on again so that you can catch the beginning of it again, because you, you, you're so, you know, enthralled by it. So to me, that was the way to like get me interested in films is because I could just come upon a scene right away. Netflix doesn't have it. You got to start at the beginning. Well, I might not want like what I see. You know what I mean? It might take 30 minutes into the film before I actually enjoy it. Now I can stand and stomach the first 30 minutes because I, I got to the good part. And maybe that's the wrong way of experiencing movies. I don't know, but that's how I experience movies and I miss it. Yeah. No, there's, I, I definitely miss that as well. Just kind of flipping through and landing on something. I mean, even if it's something you'd seen before, like, um, you might be excited about the part you're watching and then you end up watching a half hour and you're like, man, I don't remember how well this, you know, this scene was, or was shot or, you know, man, they really chose the right needle drop uh, here for oh, this yeah. song. Like, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that you, you can't, you don't get to experience when you're judging a, a, a movie by the Netflix poster. Right. Right. So, yeah. What's your favorite needle drop in uh, No Country for Old Men, Will? I'm I'm pretty sure that movie does not have any music in it, Robert. And I'm I'm being serious. I don't think it has any music in it. It, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't. That's why I it was... so. 
It's it's um, got no soundtrack to it whatsoever. That's why I threw it out yeah. to you. I just wanted to okay. see if you remembered. <laughs> yeah, no, that that movie I have seen at least ten times. Oh, um, I haven't seen it ten times, but I've seen it half of that, and it's yeah. The first yeah. I remember, like the first couple times, what I was watching it for wasn't even it wasn't even the message. Like, right? It took me a minute. Yeah. I was like, holy crap! It wasn't until it hit where I was like. I feel like a man with no country. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the movie. I got to go back and watch the movie. And then you realize that, okay, this is what was going on the whole time, you know? Yeah. And it just went over my head, unfortunately. So my, my favorite needle drop in that movie is uh, Tommy Jones explaining his, uh, <laughs> his dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The ending there, huh? Um, yeah. Anything you want to add before we kind of, uh, um, talk a little bit about what you know about jazz singer before we get there anything you want to add about what the show is going to be maybe why film you know just why it's you know your favorite medium um anything you want to add to it will yeah um so film was always my favorite medium because um you know i like that well first off when i really fell in love with film tv really hadn't developed itself into like a true true That's like fair. story character um type of uh medium like it was very procedural it was very you know if it wasn't a procedure it was a sitcom where you're watching a group of people laugh for a half an hour and then they go do something silly in the next episode which is fine um and and fun but um for me it really you know just kind of the movie that really changed changed me from like movie enjoyer to like i like studying this stuff was um casino royale uh okay. in 2006 um because all of a sudden we had a bond that was like not just fun but like actually um was concerned with who bond was and yeah um, and inner you know, turmoil yeah. yeah yeah and on top of on, on top of all that it's just one of the most beautifully shot movies of you know that decade um, and that's really when I started to like, you know, I've probably seen Casino Royale 25, 30 times in my life, partly because, and call back to DVDs, but when you, when you bought something on a DVD and you had eight DVDs, you watch those movies, you know, once a week. Right. So, yes. um, yeah, it really wasn't until Casino Royale when I started thinking about film a little bit more seriously. Um, and that was, you know, right after, you know, high school for us. So. Um, I'm, I'm just excited to kind of take the way I've been watching movies since then, because a lot of what I do watch is, you know, recent stuff or stuff I've missed in the last couple of years. I'm excited to kind of take that back a ways and start watching those movies a little bit more seriously. Um, and with my, with my film eye rather than my like entertainment eye. So, uh, real quick before I kind of get into my reason, um, do you miss the fact that you can't just watch with an entertainment eye or can you make the switch? I have one, one trick that okay. I use for the switch. It's when I'm falling asleep and I want to watch something new, but it's not, I'm not ready to be enthralled for two hours. I want to fall asleep in 20. I'll yeah. put on action film that, you know, it doesn't, it could be, it could be foreign, it could be some crap with Mel Gibson in it, like uh, what, the Fat Man. Um, I watched that the other day, but you know that's that's my trick. I just put on a crappy action movie, and um, I end up watching it over the course of two days because I fall asleep. Okay, fair enough. So you just get it in twenty minute segments. Yep. Exactly. So you actually go back and finish it. I I've got that letterbox mentality. <laughs> I've got to finish the movie. That Even boy. if it's a one star, you gotta give it its rating. No, I agree. And you gotta give the uh once you start it, you gotta finish it. Uh that's so funny you say that you had a film because I did too. Actually, my film is a little more uh uh actually I think I might have shared this film with you before. Um there's two twofold basically that started my passion for love or film. I remember I don't remember what came first. Actually, no, I do. It, it, it was the movie. So the movie I watched was with Ben Foster. It was Bang Bang, You're Dead. Mm. And do you remember that movie at all? Did I? I showed you that movie, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. So Ben Foster, he's a he's a troubled, you know, high school student. Um, it, it kind of 
goes on to this school shooting, but the whole movie, he's carrying a camera and he's basically documenting his life. And for something, I have no reason. It's gotta, it's gotta go to the vein in me somehow. I, I, I don't know why, but like, I wanted to document everything we did. And for one summer or winter, one year, I did, I got a video camera and you remember we, we videotaped or recorded all of our wrestling in the mall and things we probably won't say on here, but we did things, you know? Um, and yep. I still have those tapes, but like the point was, was I became obsessed kind of like getting storytelling behind the, you know, behind the camera. And then I remember even something as silly as like taking two VCRs and making a wrestling promo video for Tynan and I's match. Um, that took countless hours to do. It was not something that was easy, but like, it was fun. It was a puzzle for me. I didn't like doing puzzles, but this was the puzzle for me. And then I remember senior year watching Kaylee Robichaud make a class video to Boulevard of Broken Dreams. And it was like selling the yearbook or something. Um, and do you remember that? that video that they made senior year was like blasted on the TVs that we would watch before they do morning announcements. Yeah. Do you remember that? I just yeah. remember thinking it was so well done. And I was like, Holy crap, this is going to, this is the thing that is going to be my purpose in college. I, I found what I want to pursue. So now I have my love for film. And that was always there. Cause we love you and I always loved watching movies house of D with Robin Williams and David Duchovny. I remember you oh. and I watching that movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that that's a that's an actual movie that's not a uh a naughty movie for those that are listening but anyways um so just things like this so like just getting to the next level so now i'm in college and i'm pursuing filmmaking and i have absolutely no idea but i remember this is the thing that stood out to me in college and i'll wrap up my take here is i wanted to make kind of like dramedy film you know, more human stories, these like gut wrenching things that were like, we both have comedy and drama in our life. And I just, for some reason, those speak to me so much when you play to the, uh, to the, the common man who's on a journey of self-discovery and like a greater truth, but like is faced with some semblance of inner turmoil or whatever, you know, like sure. Zach Braff. Oh my God. Hello. Like that type of melodrama is like my, right where I like to be. Now, I remember being in college being like, hey guy, who, who wants to make a film like this with me? Nobody. Everybody wanted to make horror genre, zombie killer, like nobody <laughs> wanted to come near what I was doing. I felt very alone. But that's where my love for dissecting film, you know, came in because now I'm in school learning about how to dissect film. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm watching uh, a trip to the moon. I'm watching Metro metropolis. I'm watching apocalypse now and some of these classics. And I'm like, Holy crap, getting them broken down by somebody that knew what they were talking about. Like yeah. you just fall in love with storytelling and not just storytelling, but the art of film and how it's done and the choices that the director makes and the actors make. And when it's come together, how perfect it is, you know, yeah. that's just, I, that's why I, 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 I wanted to go back and do this. And you were the perfect person to do it with. So I'm very happy that we're doing this together. I am too. I'm very excited for this, this journey. All right. Let's, let's let, I'm going to ask you one final question. We'll wrap it up. What is your, any, what is any knowledge you have in your excitement level about watching the jazz singing? What do you um, know about this movie prior uh, before we started talking about this, <clears throat> I had no idea it was the first, um, the the first talkie. Okay. Um, I hadn't ever gone back this far to to look at films before. Um, the farthest I ever made it was um, uh, obviously Wizard of Oz in '39, and then I can't remember is Gone Gone with the Wind that I year think that's thirty nine. I think yeah, that's thirty nine. So I have seen Gone with the Wind. That's also been like you know fifteen twenty years ago though. So um, there's you know. I, I'm excited to see what these films are like. I don't necessarily think I'm going to like a lot of the films <laughs> that we see early on, but um, you know, they're, they're, that's two different things, right? Uh, my enjoyment of it and as a film and my enjoyment of it as a project, um, I'm very excited about the project for sure. Yeah. The education of it. Right. I, uh, yeah. I, I feel like that's, 
you know, just as a consumer of film, you know, I, anytime you can get more educated on the topic that you love and be able to better engage or just, you know, it's funny. We've got a movie coming out this year called Napoleon with Joaquin Phoenix and mm. in 1927, Napoleon came out, you know what I mean? Mm. So like, this is not new. I mean, obviously Napoleon was a great figure and all that stuff in time, but like the point being is that these are not new stories that are being told now. They've been made countless times before and you just don't know it, you know, and it's going to be interesting to see what their take was prior to this new take. So for all of those, right. we will not be watching that one, but if you guys wanted to go a little bit deeper into it, Napoleon came out in 1927. It was not a talkie, but check it out. See if you like it. So, okay. uh, I didn't know anything about the film other than that. I remember in college, they tell, told us that it just stuck with me for some reason. Um, there's a great documentary that HBO or no CNN put together. It was the history of movies and they went through the decades. Um, mm. and, uh, I remember them saying that L Jolson, you know, that name stuck with me and they, they, all the, all the talking heads on that show do a really good job of like romanticizing film mm. and, you know, and that part, I, I just speaks to me too. Just like when they do a, a good setup and then you hear L Jolson kind of come in and deliver it just kind of that makes you emotional about film that's where my patriotism is that's where my end of it i'm like it's connected into that and uh yeah so i'm excited to look to watch it i'm sure we'll be bored to tears at times if not for majority of it especially because it's a part talkie um yeah but uh where, where are you gonna watch this at what, what's it on youtube pretty sure it's on youtube yeah that's so for that's our listeners claim. that want to watch with us it's i think he's will said it's free on youtube yeah, it, sh it should be. I mean, if you don't mind me doing a little live action uh, no, search, I can go ahead and confirm that. Because um, if not, yeah. I think Voodoo is usually where I go to buy most of my, my movies now. But Yeah, as long as you're going to expense it to the, the podcast account, you can go ahead and buy it for me too. Cinema 100, yeah, we'll just, I'll just give you my podcast or my, uh, my password. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it looks like it's, oh no. Did they okay. get rid of it? Well, it's you can you can rent it on YouTube. So at the very least, um, if I can't find the um, the full movie, I, that's where I'll be watching it. I'll just give it the, a give it a twenty four hour rent there. Yeah, the the big thing is just being able to have access to this. You know, that's another thing is like that being everything's digital these days. It's great that we have access to most of it. Um, but like the problem is, is that we're gonna spend, you know four five six bucks seven bucks on something and not have it you know what i mean yeah. and that yeah. that's the thing about dvds that was so nice is that whenever you wanted to reference it or go back to it it was there you know we don't have that no more so yeah. but all right man al jolson and the jazz singer 1927 it's gonna change your life <laughs> i suppose so hopefully it's all not right, a jazz teaser so when are you, uh, yeah, yeah. I remember when I left drum roll, I was like, I gotta be a drummer. When I left Fast and Furious, I was driving fast. When I leave here, I'm gonna be waking my grandma up in her sleep singing jazz yeah, music. You're still driving fast. What are you talking about? Yeah, I am. I, I wasn't fumbling around with anything. I was just late getting here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, look, let's, uh, so off air, we'll talk about when we're gonna do this. But for everybody watching, everybody listening to this, uh, Jazz Singer, 1927. Next time you hear us, we'll be discussing that film, and then we will set up the next slate of films. Uh, probably be a separate podcast, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how much we have to say about the Jazz Singer. Um, if, okay. You know, if we're trying to keep these nice and tight hour or whatever we're looking at, then I think we might be able to squeeze in the uh, talking about the next year, depending on okay. if we're only looking at like four or five movies, then. You know, it's, it's funny you say that, talking about a tight hour, is that uh, I think this is going to test, and we'll, we'll get some categories and we'll, we'll get it out. We've, we've already got some things that we want to talk about. I think, you know, the bigger thing is going to be when we start talking about, like, society as a whole and what's going on and tying it in. You know, in some years, there's not going to be those big monumental things, but then there's going to be some years that, you know, what like you said, what the, the director is talking about or why the movie was made was a direct – combative to what's happening in society. So like, you know, art reflecting life type thing. Um, those are going to yeah. be the bigger discussions, you know? So yeah, I think, sure. uh, I think it'll end up being the show will be what the show is. You know, if it needs more, it takes more then we do more, but if it doesn't, then we wrap it up. So. All right. But, all right. He's William. 
I'm Robert, Cinema 100. First episode done. We'll talk to you guys next time. Peace. See you.